for, for the past few days we've been discussing the advantages of open science and um, how it can drive innovation. So this project wouldn't be possible without um, open data sets. So um, my group at the Salk Institute, we are um, primarily a computational lab. And the data that I will be describing was um, collected in the laboratory at Berkeley. And uh, the general problem that we would like to understand is um, the object recognition. Um, as many of you know, um, might know, the um, mouse is not working, but um, so um, I will do an interpretive dance to, um, to uh, point to things that are on the slide. Um, so uh, basically, uh, if you look at on the right, um, side, if you show um, a hand, the neuron re IT, this IT neuron responds a lot. If you simplify it to a medium, the response is just reduced. For that neuron, if you show a face, the response is abolished. But then if you show a hand at 90 degrees, then the response comes back. So if we assume that to the first approximation, signals neurons in V1 ho uh, code edges, then presumably to encode a hand, I need a combination of um, at least 10 edges for the five fingers of the hand. But then it has to be across all positions, across all rotations, and not to get confused with the meton in between. So I think it's an interesting, well, obviously it's an interesting theoretical problem of how to wire these signals achieving invariance and selectivity. And what is astonishing for me was when I learned that um, they were, we were talking about convergence and divergence. So it turns out that even from V1 to V4, um, a single V4 neuron can get as much, um, collect signals from as much as the one-sixth of the V1 surface. So it's an incredible degree of convergence, and if it is without any rules, then my guess is that all hope of the selectivity would be lost. And um, so the goal is to um, somehow to figure out how signals are processed within the visual stream, and with uh, the hope that this will be a model for how we can understand other sensory modalities. So the general approach that um, we would like to have is a little bit similar to the deep networks that um, are popular nowadays, but we were doing this even before the deep networks. Um, so with, we present the animal with uh, many, um, well, ideally as many as possible natural stimuli, but um, in practice it's 20,000 to 50,000 different images. Um, for we collect responses um, sometimes to the same set of images across uh, visual areas. This is one of the advantages of using natural stimuli because they will stimulate the whole visual pathway. And if I were to use white noise images, then the primary visual cortex would respond, but the V2 and V4 will progressively respond less, and the IT uh, neurons will um, produce almost no response. And then um, that's where most of our efforts are is to finding statistical methods for statistical analysis between stimulus and response data that um, um, can elucidate how the signals are processed. So as I mentioned today, we'll, um, we'll, I will describe results from the primary area V2, uh, from the secondary visual area V2. So this is just um, uh, after the primary visual cortex, and although we Area of primary, uh, the primary visual cortex is considered one of the best understood areas in the brain. Already at the second visual area, um, it's not clear w what is the essential computation that emerges. And uh, some recent work has uh, pointed to um, the representation of images using textures, and that's um, the theme that we will discuss. Um, I will present some evidence for it um, also. So, I, I yes. Why 
Yes, okay. I, I actually I wonder about it. Um, so they are real spikes. Well, I mean, they are real spikes, but uh, the reason they're in quotes is because um, I work at the Salk Institute for Biological Studies where most people are not neuroscientists. So for them, a spike is um, kind of a met met metaph um, you know, uh, so that's why they're in quotes. Sorry, I should have removed it. At least I removed the definition of the spike, so that's much <laughs> it. I, I did as much today, but um, that, uh, that slipped. Um, so the data is um, uh, the data that was graciously uploaded by uh, Jay Gallant's laboratory to the CRCNS um, website, and uh, we actually spent a lot of effort um, assimilating the data, um, but it was still better than doing the experiments. Um, for us, it would be an infinite cost uh, because I don't have a lab. So uh, <laughs> that when, you, but you know, still it, it, one can. Uh, it's good for many perspectives. Um, um, just to give you the summary of the data, we uh, have 80, we are working with 80 V2 neurons, and on average, uh, for each data set, there are 6,000 spikes and 23,000 stimuli per neuron. And these are not static images, they are little uh, movies, about three second longs, and the animal is um, fixating. And the movie is presented roughly within the area of the receptive field of the neuron. And the size of the movie is about uh, two to, at least two to four times than the estimated receptive field of the V2 neuron. And we will be analyzing, and now I will describe the model that we use to analyze the data. Um, it has some elements of the uh, deep networks, but it also um, has a structure that I, we put in as, um, as a way to model neurobiology, and I think it, it retrospect it turned out to be essential to create a model that um, has robust features and good predictive power, so both interpretable and uh, good predictive power. So the element of, uh, the first element of the model, so imagine that um, the V2 neuron has access to this large visual scene, but actually because we want to model position invariance, it processes it in patches. So if we look at a small patch, then there will be an unknown number of filters to be determined um, during the analysis. And so the neuron will be sensitive to multiple combinations of features. Some of them will be uh, positive, meaning if the edge of, um, and those are shown here schematically as uh, blue ellipses, so if there is an edge of that matches the orientation of that blue ellipse, then um, for that model neuron, um, for, for that model of the real neuron, uh, we predict that the firing rate will be increased. And then some edges are suppressive, and um, suppression is an important part of models, and um, it's often, I think, is, is not incorporated explicitly into uh, deep network models. And uh, we actually, that was one of the findings that I will describe today. And the reason cross-orientation suppression, at, as, it, as it's called in neuroscience, is important is because um, um, it can help uh, enhance the selectivity of neural responses to edges. So what does it mean to detect an edge? It means to detect an edge of the correct orientation and not to detect an edge of the orthogonal orientation. So using these combinations of rules of both um, selectivity for one edge and selectivity and, and abs um, negative selectivity, suppressive selectivity for the other edge would enhance um, um, the sharpness of tuning. So in this, but this is, doesn't actually be assumed by the model. It just says um, there will be some arbitrary number of filters to be determined during the fitting. Some of them will be positive, some of them will be negative. The output of that filter will be passed through nonlinearity, which is schematically symbolized here by the quadratic function. One can also view this as an expansion into a um, quadratic space. And it has both linear term and um, uh, quadratic term. So for, the, uh, v, um, for those who work with primary visual cortex, it's a way of modeling both simple and complex cells. Then the output of these nonlinearities is summed and pass through a sigmoid, and that's one element um, of computation at one position. And then the convolutional aspects of the model 
come about because we repeat the same block, the same we call it a local quadratic model block, quadratic because it's passed through a quadratic nonlinearity, uh, across different positions. And then the signals are weighted uh, in a non-uniform manner across space and across time. And then the result is passed through a, a, a spike in nonlinearity. So, and then this model has um, uh, three, three nonlinearities, the quadratic one, the saturating one, and the uh, spike in nonlinearity. So it has some elements of the deep network, and it, can, it has some elements of the convolutional aspect to it. Uh, but uh, the connections are structured or are grouped locally. So if we remove um, any one of these um, nonlinearities, it actually maps to one of the existing models that people have used in the past. But we, um, and I will show you uh, if, we, if, if there is interest um, of how the model performance drops if we remove any one of these nonlinearities and end up with a model where uh, there is an arbitrary number of connections, but there is no convolution, or there is convolution, but there is only one filter um, per position, and so on. So, um, and then, so we fit this model for each neuron, um, finding the number of filters at each position, what's, um, what was, um, the filters are not actually assumed to be Gabor's, but then we will later fit them to be Gabor's, so we want to find what is uh, the number of filters, are they positive, negative, how are they summed locally within the subunit, how they are summed across positions, and how they are summed in time. And all of this model is fed to uh, V2 neurons, and now I'll just summarize what we found by fitting this model to the properties of the V2 neurons. Are there any questions about the model? Or maybe um, I can just summarize some findings. So first, um, uh, I will be sh um, telling you three organizing principles for feature selectivity in V2. First, we found that at each position, so the first um, two properties will be about um, this type of nonlinearity, and then the second one will be uh, pulling, uh, and the third one will be across pulling. So locally, we find that there are many features that we can detect as significant, and um, on average, there are about eight excitatory features and six suppressive features that affect responses of V2 neurons. But it turns out that this, is, um, this complexity can be simplified first and foremost by noticing that the nearby features form the so-called quadrature pairs, meaning that um, they represent, um, so a canonical quadrature pair would be, um, a set that is um, um, a, a, an edge that is um, a feature that is uh, mostly a bar and a feature that is mostly an edge. Together in cross section, one is a cosine uh, times a Gaussian, the other one is a sine times a Gaussian. So the relative spatial phase of this oscillation, once it's multiplied by a Gaussian, is 90 degrees. So across the population, when we plot the uh, spatial phase difference between uh, near uh, centers of features that are nearby, it strongly peaks at 90 degrees. And uh, the reason we use them, so that's one simplifying um, finding, that even though there are 14 features per position, and actually there are seven pairs. And that is um, uh, consistent with the fact that these quadrature pairs are a canonical model of the V1 complex cells, which actually drive, provide the main output from primary visual cortex to V2. So one can then identify, even though we are recording from V2, what are the candidate properties of the V1 neurons, which will be this stage, that project to, uh, v, uh, that this V2 is pulling signals from. Uh, that's one simplification. And the second one was the cross-orientation suppression. So the previous graph was a schematic, but this is now real data where I'm showing for a V2 neuron uh, local features, and I'm showing what is the most dominant uh, positive feature and most dominant negative feature, and one can see they're approximately oriented at 90 degrees. And here are other features for that uh, neuron. And one can see that positive features approximately have the same orientation. 
and then the suppressive features are all approximately uh, orthogonal to a neighboring excitatory features. And across the population, one can see that um, the orientation difference between uh, excitatory feature and the suppressive feature is close to 90 degrees. So we started with, um, say, 14 um, features per position. We can simplify into seven pairs. And now each ellipse is a pair of features. And then uh, we, you know, conceptual the simplification is that positive and negative edges are orthogonal. So then we are talking about this becomes like a motif. And then there may be three different motifs for a V2 neuron that it um, um, uses to characterize its feature selectivity. So at this point, I would like to acknowledge that this is only for one class of V2 neurons, and we call it orientation tuning class. And I actually mentioned that the area V2 is a very complicated area. Um, it, it, although it is um, up for discussion, but um, anatomically, area V2, one can think of it as maybe three different areas uh, that are intertwined, and uh, there are um, thick stripes, pale stripes, and thin stripes, and they have different preference for projecting um, to either V4 or um, this would be object more, more of the object recognition area or area V5 or MT, which would be more of the motion processing area. And most studies have um, of uh, V2, neur uh, V2 neurons typically find two subpopulations of neurons. And that was true of the uh, Gallant's paper. Um, this is the data set that we are using. But also to other publications where they characterize V2 neurons according to how diverse their features were uh, spatially. And we also found two subpopulations of neurons. Um, our measure of how uh, complicated their tuning was locally to orientation was this measure of angular deviation, which is, um, I'm going to explain it using few examples. So this is an example with angular deviation close to zero, where all the excitatory blue features have approximately the same orientation. And uh, so, and actually the color, the saturation of the color is uh, the strength with which the, this subunit is affecting responses of V2 neurons. But then there are other neurons for where the excitatory signals are all over the place and form a more complicated pattern that we don't yet know how to characterize, put it in words. Um, but for now, one can say that there is a clear bimodal distribution between um, neurons that are tuned locally to the same orientation and neurons that are um, tuned to a, a combination of local orientations. So. On one hand, this reproduces previous results from a number of groups, but uh, at the same time, there was also another um, study of V2 neurons by Jonathan Victor's group, and they characterized neurons. They found two, also two subpopulations of V2 neurons, but they characterized them in terms of their dynamics, whether the neurons were integrating signals in time or differentiating. And so far, we haven't talked about this, and neither were um, those publications. But we actually know something about the dynamics because these are movies and we can have uh, analyze their tuning profiles in time as much as the space. So what is shown here is the average cur temporal kernel for neurons that are tuned to uniform orientations. And one can see that it is biphasic in time. It has both positive, um, some time moments are um, weighted positively and some latencies are weighted negatively. And then for neurons that are more diverse in orientations, then there is a uniform tuning profile. So using this um, data set, using natural scenes and uh, open data set, one can resolve a um, question that was in the field whether the two subpopulations of V2 neurons are actually the same. And I will just uh, briefly mention that this cross rotation suppression is also holds for the second class of neurons that are more um, heterogeneously tuned locally for orientation. But one can see it's a very more complicated pattern, but usually one can find a suppressive edge neck, uh, orthogonal to a nearby um, positive edge. 
and that's the data across the orientation. So what I have described so far was uh, the, the feature selectivity of V2 neurons uh, at the first level of the model, and then I will discuss the feature selectivity of V2 neurons at the second stage of the model across positions. And um, so it turns out that most of the time the tuning across position was quite boring. It was um, uniform in space. But in 25%, um, it was biphasic, meaning that some parts of the space were weighted negatively and some parts of the space were weighted positively. So here is another one from negative to positive to negative. And what is interesting is that these types of masks of course, are very reminiscent of the mass of the filters that Hubel and Wiesel plotted in V1 for V1 neurons with respect to luminance. These masks here, one can interpret them as how V2 neurons pull the combinations of putative V1 outputs. So one can see the evidence of the repeated cortical computation across different stages. So one can ask, what are these um, biphasic neurons are good for? And one thing that they um, are good for is for detection of the so-called second-order edges. So what are the first-order edges and second-order edges? The uh, first-order edge is a change uh, in luminance across the conditions. And the second order of edge will be an example here where uh, there is a very little change in the luminance, but there's a change in the texture on both sides um, uh, of the edge, so between an animal and a tree. So one can then under, interpret these findings by saying that locally, the um, local selectivity determines what kind of texture a neuron will be most sensitive to. But then if it is a uniform second pooling mask, then it will be selective to a patch of texture. But if it is um, a biphasic pooling mass, such as the one shown here, then such neuron will be selective for these second order edges that um, represent changes um, in texture, in position. So, um, in summary, we one can build on the knowledge, so we know that signals go from V1 to V2 and to V4 and MT, and there are certain properties of signals in V1, such that the neurons are often um, are sensitive to combinations of features and form quadrature pairs, so that's the canonical model of complex cells. The, in V1, we know that their orientation selectivity is enhanced if one um, by combining excitatory and suppressive features in a proximately orthogonal manner. And we see evidence of both of these computations for neurons in V2. Now, they're not se selective for one orientation, but a combination of orientations. But each orientation is a pair of features, a quadrature pair, and the pairs also pair up, being excitatory and suppressive. So an evidence of this um, type of computation. And some neurons are tuned more to the same orientation, and those are the ones that are more sensitive to changes in time. And I think these are the neurons that project to MT. And other neurons are more selective for more diverse shapes, and they integrate things in time, and those are the ones that I think project to V4. So then, um, one can discuss that some edges across both of these um, neuronal classes, we see that approximately one quarter of um, each of these type of neurons is selective for these biphasic masks um, that would indicate uh, the selectivity for edges in the world that are not defined by changes in luminance but more complex features. So, um, finally, one can talk about how these signals speak to feed into higher um, areas, maybe area V4. And um, so in this case, we analyzed this V4 data. It was an earlier study, and we had a simplified model where the responses of V4 neuron 
were, were modeled as um, we only estimated two dominant features per neuron and then fitted them instead of the regular Gabors with these curved Gabors. And what one can see is that this is an example of um, two features for a V4 neuron. And one can see that it is um, also quadr something like a quadrature pair, but along a curved contour. So if you look in the cross section, it goes neg uh, positive, negative, positive, <coughs> or positive, negative. So that would be like a cosine in the cr uh, cross section, and this would be like a sine in the cross section. And of course, in the V4 neurons, there is also, um, it's even less well understood area than V2. And there is a number of neurons, so that was one V4 neuron. Another V4 neuron is sensitive to almost um, straight edges. And um, there was actually a trade off, I'm just summarizing the findings. And um, the trade off such that neurons that are uh, selective for uh, tighter curvatures had um, less position invariance than neurons that were selective for um, straight curvatures. And I can understand this computationally. For example, you have um, a, a, an animal, the contour that you would like to encode. If it is an elbow, then I would like to know a very curved feature. I would like to know its position more precisely than uh, position of a more straight edge where I can allow for more mm, variance um, across, across the edge. So, and one can actually check this finding using the, uh, parametric stimuli where neurons are, uh, were probed with little segments that were either, and um, these are two examples of two V4 neurons that were probed with parametric stimuli that um, had a combination of three edges, and these edges were either uh, straight or had different degrees of curvature. So there were some neurons with large position invariance, and in this case, we plot um, all the features that evoke more than 95% of the peak firing rate, and all the features have um, approximately the same orientation, but for a neuron that is not position invariant, then the preferred feature changes strongly with position. So with this, I would like to thank you for your attention and thank my group. This work was done by uh, Ryan Rovenkamp um, based on the analysis, as I said, of um, public data set. Thank you for your attention.